right now we have uh, we have our session on uh, open discussion future of the model production suite. So we've got over an hour, hour and well now about three quarters. Anyway, um, to extend the questions you might have had for Hendrik before our um, our discussion that we had in the uh, Ask the Branch Chiefs. Naturally, there's some overlap. So we'll let Hendrik uh, start this, and then we'll just see what uh, what what evolves. Yeah, I'm going to take I'm going to take a few minutes just to uh, to frame this a little bit. You might as well keep the lights up. Okay. The, <coughs> the the guiding principle, the red thread going through everywhere, is that we really recognize that we need to get uh, to a simple unified modeling suite that really is. Uh, requirements based in a smart way. Uh, the fact that, that we literally have had so many times uh, somebody run up to Louis or somebody else high up in the organization and saying, hey, I got this beautiful product uh, that is needed in, uh, in, uh, in the, the Western Africa region, and uh, uh, if you just implement my model, you have this product. And that's how we got in part to this. Not completely, because it's like not like we got pushing that kind of stuff, but that is how, how we get a, a, a very complicated uh, uh, situation, and we've, we've already specifically pointed out that on the, on the meso side that uh, we have uh, uh, a potential set of redundancy, and we have potential redundancy between global and meso, et cetera, et cetera. The key is really to, uh, to look at, uh, at uh, figuring out what kind of product you need in order to be able to fulfill requirements. And once you know the requirements of the products, you figure out whether your products are good enough and you improve the underlying models to get them better based on requirements. And so that's easier said than done. And so if you look at what I showed yesterday, starting from products, the easiest way to start from products is to look at what kind of time scales you need. It's never going to be completely clean. There's always test that's not going to fit. And if you do this, then you can come to the conclusion, well, you could throw the S2S out because you could do that with different things. And we could, you could do three, you could five, you could do seven. This is just a straw man starting off, which sort of fits what we're doing already, but also gives us the opportunity to really try and compress. And so if you look at uh, the coupling, that's OK. This is really sort of a, a picture that I use in my mind to see how we can simplify the production suite while making it better rather than giving up stuff. The issue really is if you look at it, if you open for discussion whether these are the right labels, uh, if it's the right the right range you're looking at. Open for discussion, everything else in between. But the key is if you look at all the different bits and pieces that we have. There definitely is a clear, in, in this week thing, whether it's a one week or eight days or 10 days or three days, there's a lot of overlap in products. And I really love it when I hear the individual folks, whether you're the users or whether you're my modelers, talk about how we can collapse this. But the one thing I think we need to do a little better, and I hope to get also out of this discussion, is that we shouldn't say, OK, uh, example, don't want to uh, uh, signal anybody out, but can we use the GFS instead of the NAM for the NAM nest um, uh, boundary conditions and get rid of the NAM? That's not necessarily the right question. The question is not yes or no, we can do that. The question is, if we want to go to a unified system, what are the problems we have right now? What is holding us back? What is the science we need to do? And what's the development we need to do to make this into one more unified system? And so the question that I may completely wrongly interpret that, but the way I look at that discussion is it told me, no, today I cannot get rid of the NAM because the NAM has specific issues or specific features, particularly in the physics and in the, in the boundary layer and in the, in the profiles, that is that the GFS in no way can reproduce. So my next question is, how can I unify my modeling system so that that isn't the case anymore? So we can use this not only to look at how we compact it, 
for me, just as important in terms of being able to go forward rapidly is to use this to identify what the real high payoff research and development is going to be. And I really love going to this kind of meetings, and I really love the idea that we've been sort of thinking and throwing balls around for a year already on this. And still, every time I, I go out to this meeting, I pick a few, few more things up. We've always said, uh, at least in, uh, in, with a lot of the individuals at EMC, yeah, we really need to do something about physics. We have ignored that in a while. We've, we've said for, for a few years that, uh, yeah, we're working on the DICOR project, understanding that the real improvement is probably going to come in the physics, that the DICOR selection is really building the infrastructure and building the capability to use uh, future uh, computing, computer upgrades. It has become very clear to me in the last day and a half that we definitely should, if possible at all, accelerate what we're doing with, uh, with the physics. That uh, it is not only low-hanging fruit, because there is work done on all, all kinds of places, there is already a lot of research done, but it's also, if we can figure out a way of having proper scalable physics that work on both the global and the meso scale, then we're getting a step ahead of saying we're now unifying the global models, and in 19 we're going to look at the, at the meso models. We can actually start that work already. And so I'm very excited in general about uh, the, the willingness of uh, people inside of my organization, the people uh, that we work with uh, in, uh, uh, in terms of the service centers, uh, our partners in OAR. Uh, we may have lively and hard discussions about bits and pieces and details about which models should be coming in today and which should be leaving today. But whenever we have these discussions, let us realize that it is amazing how well we are aligned and where we want to go long term. It's really the discussion about how to get there. So having said that, uh, I want to hear from everybody if this is a good base idea to start with. And by the way, it was really funny. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was sitting uh, at the GSD review, and uh, I had uh, just uh, put this slide together on the plane over to Ezreal, and uh, when I was sitting at the last day, uh, sitting down with Sandy, talking about strategy and about how to combine OER and uh, the service effort, he came up with exactly the same type of separation, except for the fact that he is an American Use the metric system. It went from one year to a tenth of a year to a hundredth of a year, and I, as a European, decided to take an absolutely non-metric approach to this. So it is really interesting to see that, that, that I know from just talking with Sandy that the idea is not that far out, but I really need to know and I really need to start vetting uh, if this is a good starting point to begin with and fill it out, or whether we need to go a step further back and see where we're going. Let's uh, start with Andy. And please use your mics because we do have we do have a lot of folks online. Whether they are online just because of these also or actually listening, I don't know. But so I, I like where this is going. I guess my one question is: we've heard a lot about the GFS needs to be upgraded, enhanced, to, to, you know, to clean a boundary layer to really serve that role, and yet we have this effort called an NGPS. Yep. So. What's your vision? When do we see the fruits of that effort in a schedule like this? See, that, there's, there's two sides to that. On the one side, we, we deliberately said, I got, the, I, got the, I, I deliberately rigged myself. Uh, uh, on the one side, um, when we started looking at modernization, uh, while we're modernizing, although that's sort of a, a four letter word in the weather service. While we're modernizing, um, we're still running an operational show. The last thing we want to do is be stagnant with what we're doing right now and fall further behind. So we have to find sort of a balance. So our original balance was, okay, let's – global is foundational for everything we're doing, whether you like it or not, and whether or not your focus is and your resources need to go to the CONUS, very high resolution stuff. It still relies on the foundation of, of, of your global work. And so let's start with the global, but while we're working on the global, let's look at all the bits and pieces that, uh, that are in place, that are unified. And so we have something like 13 teams identified, a little bit 
too much. But there are a few teams that are more equal than others. The Dicor team is very uh, high visibility right now because of the because of the of the foundational part of that and to build the architecture. The infrastructure team is really foundational because we really want to make sure that we go to a NEMS environment and not have parallel developments uh, and, and therefore use our re uh, resources better. Uh, Post-processing, uh, data simulation are essential, but the one that is also essential is the physics group. For the first time in a long, 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 long time, we are actually setting up a really dedicated focused physics group across all scales. That physics group put together its first uh, deliverable, which is the, uh, the, the unified interface, in June last year. So we're making good progress with that. And we're actually looking, it's, it's, I know Stan and his folks are looking at, uh, at both the scalar physics and uh, the statistical, uh, or the stochastic uh, physics. Uh, we, we already have ongoing projects funded by CPO to work with the same guys and in the same, in the, in the same uh, bits and pieces. So, so we are not focusing on it in terms of what we advertise because we focus on the die core, but we do it in such a way that we are already working on uh, all these bits and pieces. And if you look at PJ's timeline, I don't know if you saw all the bits and pieces of the DFS upgrades. The key there is that in the 17th upgrade, I believe, we are going to retire, planning to retire the old global spectral model and use the, the, the NEMS version. So whatever we do between 17 and 19 on the GFS will be done in a unified physics package. So it will all go over directly into, into uh, the uh, uh, new model, new unified model with the new core. And uh, we, we are not waiting for doing this. We have ongoing research. And if that is ready, we will accelerate it if that's appropriate. Hey, just one quick clarifying question on the uh, the left side of the chart. Uh, the CFS, uh, is your intent when we get to the NGGPS era that your climate model will be a lower resolution version of whatever you do for NGGPS? I'm assuming that's the case, but if not. Yeah, we are, we, if, if you've seen some of my previous, the previous version of this, this was only looking at the left side. I foresee us to have a unified global couple modeling system that where the year, month, and week are applications of the same software package. But in, in such a way that we may switch off our own bits and pieces of coupling as they are relevant or not. And no, this is not just modeling. This is also for DA. And so on the DA side, we need to figure out what we do still, because there are some, some more strategic questions there. Ideally, you would run a DA system in an ensemble version at as high as possible resolution as you can, can for, for the, the weak slot, which is really the sweet spot for the, for the global part. You can ask yourself if you have to have an hourly or six hourly cycling part of that, that's all details and don't care about too much. The real question right now, at least, uh, of course, the, all these questions need to be answered. The real question is, do I have a single system and three different applications for that? Because on the climate side, I might want to make sure that my system does not change as, or is as static as possible for, for uh, the CPC requirements. Or am I going to evolve a single high-resolution uh, DA system that I upscale to the lower resolution? So these are science questions. This is, this is where this kind of planning is really neat because it, it, it automatically pushes you to a whole bunch of science questions that you need to answer. And that would make it much more efficient for us and our other to work together because we can work off the same playbook in terms of uh, what research needs to be done uh, because it's good research, but also because it's strategically directed. us. Hendrik, is, uh, um, Hendrik, I'm sorry. Um, I'm wondering if we're getting too far down into the weeds too soon here, at least for the next few moments. Um, you're asking for requirements, and I guess I'd have to ask but, or I guess I'd have to say that in order to give requirements, we need to know what it is we're going to do. Um, you mentioned that you think everybody's in agreement with the long term. I think is the way you just phrased it a moment ago. I guess I'd like to hear more about that because I want to kind of get 
confirmation that what you all are thinking of in the long term is aligned with what we might need in the field in the long term. I'm, I'm talking. I'm talking about uh, long term. I have a little. I have a little bit of a focus on the modeling side. So that's, that's my purview. But the understanding that my modeling is irrelevant if there's no products coming out of it. So I need your input for that. So I'm not trying to have tunnel vision at all. What, what, what on the modeling side are, are uh, big picture issues are, is are we going to really try and map our requirements to the type of product scale that we make sense? On the modeling side, I think between the science group, we're, we're in violent agreement that ideally you go to uh, a single model, a single modeling system, where all your effort can be really focused on making that system better, and for a organization as ours, that will give us the best model the quickest. And if we want to do multi-model ensembles, we rely on bringing stuff in from the outside to do multi-model approach. And then the, th the, th the third one, and there's a little bit more discussion on that, uh, um, how, how aggressive are we going to go for with coupling? And so so that, that strategically, that is, is pretty clear. If you look on this picture, uh, the problem you have really is that uh, on this side, we know that coupling in the modeling is absolutely important. There are some different, uh, different thoughts about whether you need an VA. I know that, that uh, for instance, Dave is, is a little less convinced of the fact that we need to do couple DA. I just went uh, to a few international workshops, and uh, uh, I think some of the other centers are, are very rapidly moving towards the idea of that. So we need to figure, we need to figure out what, what the proper path is. In, in, um, in, uh, same thing with uh, the, if you go to week three and four. Uh, over here, the real problem is we want to go to a single modeling system, the real the real problem is how do you do that? Uh, where do you focus on beginning with? Where do you not focus on? On this scale, on the day scale, ideally you would say that you're going to do a um, uh, just a hourly cycling system that only makes sense up to up to how far you go forward. With uh, I mean, seven days forward, you're not going to see the difference between one or two hours difference in the initial condition. Uh, yeah, you're going to see differences, but it's for a completely different reason. But some of the stuff that's coming very clearly out of these discussions is that you probably want to have a system that is sitting here. Uh, uh, you, you may have a global system that, uh, that is uh, at the same resolution and ensemble. But there's a lot to say also for having an hourly cycling system with a few components going further out. That seems to be a consensus approach to getting real good results over time. The real question for me in terms of where no consensus exists is on the war and forecast part. And the reason why I'm saying that is, is not because it may not consist, it may not exist, but I've seen five or six different modeling approaches to that. And I've seen a, and that this is my own fault as just as much as anybody else's. I don't see that day one trying to figure out how we can do it in operations. And this could very easily for me become a really good effort uh, that is done in another part of the weather service that gives you a really good product that's going to give me all these headaches to try and integrate it into our system later. So we need to make sure that on this side, on this side, we really, we really uh, get uh, the uh, alignment on the strategy really quick. On this side, I have another problem still. And this is more I'm going to talk about it in the requirement side. There is a branch of the FS that is looking at analysis. And a lot of the work they're doing, traditionally, the parts of AFS that have been populated with that part, with, uh, with the old weather service, we have a pretty lousy track record of communicating and of, of planning together. So we need to fix that. Too. I don't know if that's completely answered your question. OK, so at least I've got a better idea as to what you're talking about. And a lot of this is kind of under the hood. So we've heard of discussions this morning about probabilistic forecasts and ensembles and so forth. So I guess my question is, how are we defining probabilistic forecasting? And how does this 
help us with that. I can give you the question from my perspective. But my perspective is that I, as EMC, need to be able to provide you in the field with everything you need to do to actually serve the public. And this is not a cop-out, but the first step for me there is that let me focus on my side. Let me focus on the modeling part. The foundation of probabilistic forecasting has to be some ensemble-based system. I heard some really interesting quotes uh, yesterday about how people were against that. So those of you who don't remember, my first quote on ensembles was, have you ever read that book, uh, Lies, Them, Lies, Statistics? I would say Lies, Them, Lies, Statistics, and Ensemble. So I'm 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 back of that I'm back of that thing. I'm completely ensemble based now. But but um, I want EMC in this picture to focus on getting the best possible ensemble, starting with the best possible numerical models for the type of products that we want to generate, and then the best possible ensemble based on that. When it comes to how you use that to do probabilistic forecasting to the public. There are, there are smarter people than I to deal with that. My problem as a modeler is to make sure that I get that kind of information that you need for that, and that I work with NCO to get it to the right place. So does that mean that I can ignore that? No. Because if there's any kind of design criteria or design requirement for me to do modeling that's going to influence how you can do the probabilistic forecasting to the public, the earlier I know that I can work on, I can help with making sure that something like that is built. And so, no, I'm not trying to get out of that, but this is exactly what we're trying to do with the modeling and the post-processing. Uh, Mike and, uh, uh, and Stan and I and a few others and Tom have been talking about this for about a year and a half. Right now, post-processing, statistical post-processing, bias correction is rather slow fight over different organizations. That's not an efficient way to do business. And so we've been starting off between Mike and I with saying the idea, well, wouldn't it be a novel idea if I would really specialize in the modeling and you would really specialize in the post-processing? And so right now he's doing a bit of modeling left and right, and I'm doing a bit of post-processing. Let's, let's figure out. That's why we're going to have the January workshop. Hendrik, just a comment. I thought that was a very nice uh, table you put together on the airplane a month ago. And I, I would just say this, we, we've talked a lot about the day and the hour here, and we think there is a, is a great deal of overlap area right now between those two areas here. Until we have the word on forecast on a 200 meter scale, then we see uh, the area in which we can contribute from the day convective resolving down to the word on forecast is really to have fixed one kilometer nests and key areas, maybe floating, but, but to be able to do that, and then to fit that well within the uh, operational uh, uh, resources that you have. So I think there's a great opportunity there. We should obviously talk more in the future, but uh, I think they're not quite as distinct there. We can pull that out of our existing kind of convective allowing model capability. I, I agree with that, but, but the benefit of looking at it from this perspective is that instead of, instead of this, this focuses you more, I think, if you start thinking this way, it focuses you more on, on, on really getting the maximum bang for the buck out of the minimum amount of product. And, and I, I, I have no, I completely agree with what you're saying. I, I, I want to be very flexible with that. But I want to avoid that one on forecast becomes, oh, look at the nice tool I built. You, should, you better implement it. Oh, I don't care whether it fits into your present operational system or not. And, and the, the one thing I respectfully disagree with you on, I'm in the process of putting together uh, a little, a little, uh, 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 white paper type thing about what this costs. And I much rather uh, go uh, uh, forward uh, on my level to say I really need a 200 petaflop machine for this very specific reason, and this is what I'm going to do with it, than trying to shoehorn something into the machine. Yeah, because even the 2.8 petaflop machine that we're going to have soon. Uh, just because, and, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but just because we are going to have to do a very high resolution, uh, a high density um, uh, reforecast for the GEFS 
so that uh, nothing that uh, the water sensor does uh, and their downstream users do breaks. That's already going to pick up a heck of a lot of that machine just for a six-month period, which may make it rather difficult to even go to in, in full-time operations quickly to uh, a, uh, a uh, her, her style and style. I don't think we disagree on anything here. We're willing to be flexible with you in both combining those columns as well as trying to justify resources. So we're with you in both areas, OK? Mm -hmm. uh, Henrik, uh, Peter Neely from the Mayor Company again. Um, so a question and then perhaps a follow-on comment. Um, heard here in just about almost all the equivalent forums like this before about the essential need for requirements gathering, requirements vetting, and requirements prioritization, and I think in your own words, distinction between requirements and wants. Um, is that a process that is clear and tangible to you? And if so, what is it? No. Uh, we're going to discuss that, that more tomorrow, but no, that is not. And um, the fact that this meeting is very successful in general over the last 20 years is for two reasons. First of all, just look at yesterday. Everybody is saying we should discuss more and we should talk less about the model. But there were close to 200 people sitting here listening to these, uh, all these uh, brief, quick uh, reviews. And I know a lot of people like Tom, especially Tom, to see what's what, what going on. And, but the other side is that with that, break, <coughs> with that broken process of requirement, this meeting has almost been the replacement for that. And it really cannot be. It needs to be done in a better way. And that leaves a question, because at this moment, uh, AFS is, de is developing cards, uh, the, the new requirement spelling system. The interesting part is that that part of the weather service seems to be not really looking at the modeling side at all. Doesn't look at the science that knows it at all. That may be a problem. That may be something that I need to work out with Andy, how we get a better link. Uh, the other thing has been that 20 years ago, we had a process that you had to go to headquarters and get headquarters permission for every implementation. Then you had uh, 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 this is, uh, OSIP, uh, which looked like we had to do that too, and then the model suite got an exemption from not having to do that. And so hopefully with CARDS, we get something that can help us. And if CARDS doesn't work, we'll have to do it ourselves in a much better way and in a much better uh, project managed way with proper input of everybody and with proper, proper governance. And the reality is, sorry, the reality is that uh, Bill here today, no? Bill have been pushing up the chain very hard for getting a NOAA-wide modeling strategy. And the result of that is your committee, driven by us and not by high up in NOAA. So the comment, um, to, to whatever extent you or others in this room have influence on whatever that requirement gathering and bidding process comes or is, um, my experience is that that process in the past has been very insular to the National Weather Service. But the reality is that today, the vast majority of the public gets its information from weather sources other than the National Weather Service. In fact, there was one recent study by, it, it, it wasn't Nielsen, but one of those equivalent companies that said only 3% of the public actually gets their weather directly from the Weather Service, but gets it through um, other parties. Um, mostly the private sector. And um, now the private sector is heavily dependent on, not solely, but heavily dependent on foundational data that comes out of the weather service, but not from the weather service forecast itself. Um, and so we, we should be very um, cognizant of that balance of, of the use of the products um, between internal to NOAA and external to NOAA as we create those requirements. And I don't think that in the past that that balance has been correctly achieved. First, firstly, I think you give us too much credit because you assume we're doing it internally. I don't even think we did it well internally. And, and we, we, did, 
we did recognize that. I heard you say that yesterday that uh, I better put uh, the private industry on my list of requests. I will do that. Uh, over the last year, year and a half, specifically NCO has been going out to the private industry with exactly the question what kind of foundation products you need. And the reason for this, uh, this uh, five-day hourly uh, DFS uh, update is directly coming from Ben and I going to you and others to request what, what, what the highest need that you could get of raw product out of it. So, so we are making the attempt. And, and thank you for that. Uh, my, my point isn't that the private sector has been ignored. I'm just not sure that it has sort of the influence in the process that is, that is representative of actually how its content is being used to serve the nation's weather industry. Well, well, well put, and we need to pick well, I endorse everything that was just mentioned. But with all due respect, Hendrick, um, I know you hate to hear that phrase, um, but you, you started out at the very beginning, you repeated to hear at the start, about requirements and solutions. And um, all that chat really is the solution without any, as you admittedly suggested for the most part, has anything to do with requirements now or in the future. So it sounds to me as if the philosophy, the modeling strategy philosophy which you want to get developed is kind of let's let's develop it, let's do it and they will come. You know, make the feel and they will come. That's not always the case. I've experienced and others have experienced quite well. So uh, there seems to be a gross inconsistency here in developing a model strategy without any, I won't say interest, but any deep interest in what the requirements are or will be. Uh, then you completely misunderstood me. Because okay, explain it to the me. Only, the, the, o the only way we, we can really make real decisions about this is by having really vetted requirements. And so this, this is a step to build a, a, a framework, by lack of better wording, to start mapping these requirements. But this is going to be only successful if we have a decent process in place to actually get real requirements to prioritize what we need to do when we... But you don't know what aspect of this total system is or will not be, is or is not, or will or will not be, come forth as requirements. In other words, you've got a lot of effort going into things which may or may not have anything to do with requirements. For example, um, week two forecasts. Um, sure, everyone would like to be able to have forecasts for week two, but what is the strategy best suited to provide that? And then again, gets back to the deterministic or the uh, uncertainty aspect of the uh, official products we the weather service. My point is, I guess, I'm going to say it again. I'm not sure that this chart adequately displays a direct or maybe even indirect connection to what actual requirements are or will be. No argument there. But there are no argument there, but the point is we've been waiting for a decade and a half on a requirements process to... I, I, I don't... This is obviously not your... You're not your fault or your... your you've been... But it's a wider weather surface policy or lack thereof in top-down strategy. We want to look... go from grassroots up but there is no well-defined strategy of what the weather surface official product should be. And amongst this vast array of individual products that have been developed and out, are out there on the web, um, I can, many, most of us could identify those which would directly have an effect on the value of the official products, but are just sitting there in the bin without any major effort to exploit them to the benefit of the weather service and most importantly to the users of the weather service products. 
agree. Uh, but but it's it's not it's not like it's uh, uh, and one of the problems is that some of the requirements that we get uh, uh, are just just wishes from our, our users. Some of our re our requirements are basically uh, uh, pushed upon us by international or national policies. Uh, a very good example of that is uh, week three, four, three and four forecast. Uh, there's a very hard push from the White House and from others to uh, to work on week three and four because of the potential economical benefit. I would love to see some scientific proof that it makes sense. Well, that, that's actually another question I had, so I'll take the opportunity unless there's someone else here who wants to ask a question. Of when you get into the extended ranges, whether it be second or third week of the month or the season, it would be nice to have a basis upon which you can assess the intrinsic predictability, practical for predictability, on how far one can reasonably expect to go, rather than just assuming you want to go as far as you can for as long as you can. Well, I completely agree with you with that. And if you look at, if you, if you look at, uh, at um, some of the discussion today, on the one side we've been told to do evidence-based uh, decisions, yes. On the other side, we have said we need to have the herd up to 26 hours because of the FAA requirement. Uh, we've heard that we it would be nice to run the CFS uh, up to 15 months because we have to have a, we have a year requirement. These are quote unquote product requirements that we figure out where they came from, and that we have to try and serve. But is there any real value in in from a scientific perspective of even running the models? Because you have to ask yourself the question: Is there any predictability? Exactly. And, and, right. and uh, but are you constrained to having to address that issue without some feedback to the issuant, to the, pro the provider of those requirements? You see, you're asking for something which we don't think we can do in a practical way, in an economical way, without sacrificing some resources that could be better exploited elsewhere. Well, to, to give you that example with, uh, with uh, the week three and four, uh, as uh, Eugene and others know very well, I've been absolutely adamant about uh, any type of work that we've been funded to do that and any type of work that we present on doing that uh, uh, is, uh, is cast in a, uh, in a format that it is experimental and that we will only do this operationally if we get the proper additional operational resources for that. That's the only way I can work with that because I cannot really go and say, "Okay, White House, uh, you've given uh, you've given us a, uh, a million and a half uh, the next two years to do research on it." Uh, as a weather service, as a relatively low on the weather service, saying, "No, thank you, I don't want that money," doesn't work. And so, so the, the key is the key is to make sure you don't get one for the mandate. And the unfortunate reality is. That it's not science alone that, that is going to be driving what we can do. Some of these things are political decisions about the fact thou shalt. And I'm not particularly happy with that as an engineer. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased to hear your approach that you will address demands or requirements in, comp in context of the required resources. Ron McPherson used to say when he used to have unimposed mandates on him, he'd go back and say, what don't you want us to do so we can do this? I have exactly the same attitude. And I've, 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 been, I've been playing that game even with me. Good for you. So let's get this on a more productive path. You know, the science and technology informs the service. The service informs the science and technology. That's the way we've been forever. So, you know, I think it's a fallacy to have somebody over here say, I'm going to write a requirement, you're going to go do it. So I like the framework that you established. I think one of the questions that we have, and one of the recommendations I like that came out of the UMAC is, we got to have a process that informs how we make our next decisions. So when you ask, you know, what's good enough, you know, when, for example, I'm going to make something up here, week two forecast. Right now, we don't have a great deal of skill in that. But if, if there was, through all these changes, if the verification started to show that skill was informing, we would use it in a heartbeat. And the West, you know, 
lot of users, and Dave was just out at a series of meetings over the last uh, three, four months out in the West. We have a, a series of users who could use a credible two-week forecast. So I think the question for us in this room is we're supposed to be some of the, the leaders of this organization. Is this a framework that can help us move into the future? And what other critical questions should we be asking? And so I guess my critical question to you is, as we do this, how are we going to be looking at what sort of conversations have you been having internally in terms of what sort of verification do you run? I mean, how are you going to decide what's really making an improvement, what's not, that sort of thing? Because I think that's going to be useful for us to know when we can then take advantage of this on the services side. I'm actually planning to go the other way around, uh, especially with, uh, with uh, the experience we had with the latest uh, GEFS implementation. Uh, <coughs> we, we ran into a situation that we spent three or four years on, uh, on preparing an implementation, and uh, while you're doing that, the use of the model changed sufficiently that we had new users that we were not aware of in the beginning with requirements that we weren't aware of. And the parameters they looked at actually deteriorated, whereas the things that we we uh, we were focusing on were better. So I want to do it the other way around. I want to go to both the existing systems and to the uh, to uh, uh, how we plan to uh, simplify and unify this. And I want to have you guys, the regions, and the folks in the centers and the private industry tell us. What are the critical parameters that we should look at in evaluating these models? What do you use it for? How do you measure it? And so the next round of the GEFS, and I'll talk about it a little, a little, little later, we're going to start off uh, how we sort of accidentally started off at the SREF last time around. We will have an ensemble workshop, and at that ensemble workshop, we will talk to our users and our collaborators and our uh, stakeholders about what we should focus on with the next GEFS implementation. What is it what you use for? And I have a written agreement with uh, SPC that we will establish uh, the, the proper metrics that SPC needs specifically for the GEFS before we go forward with the development. And we will use these metrics all the way through to, to <laughs> assess how our research is going, and to decide what goes to operations. And see, I think that's a, a, a tangible sort of takeaway from this meeting, that we can work with you and start identifying some of these things and some measures. And I, I, I think that's really cool. And now, now we can take some of the BS on this argument, and we can start measuring what we can really do and not do. And I think that's a really great step forward. And this is, this is one slide out of a whole bunch of these, in the sense that I'm doing the same thing with, uh, with um, with all the other submodels, somewhere in that same slide deck, what I want to get populated in the next few months is exactly that. I want from all the all the centers, from all the regions, and from our uh, private users, a, a a list of which ranges do you use, what do you use it for, what are the parameters I need to validate. Uh, if we can start with that from the beginning, then we will be much much better positioned to do the research we do to help as many people as possible, and there will be much less uh, uh, nasty surprises at the end of the implementation process. Yeah, I think it's incumbent upon us to come up with a small list of uh, critical parameters that we track and we measure. Yeah, because, because we, and this is the whole point, requests, requirements, re requestments, what were the other stories? Yeah. Thank now you. the conversation is getting useful. Oh, we must be out of time then. <laughs> I thought this one was ending too quickly. When is this one ending? Yeah, yeah with regard to um, not necessarily the requirements process, but it comes down to it. Tough decisions may need to be made in the future with regard to, say, computer resources. Um, how will those decisions be made on how to how to go forward with regard to those decisions? Will it be internally EMC? Will it be at the INSEP level? 
and more specifically, how will you know the, the new councils, the new governance structure, the Mission Delivery Council, and the Portfolio Integration Council be involved in those decisions? From a practical, from a practical perspective, I wish they would not, because. But in the reality, um, these kind of hard decisions, uh, you're, you're talking about a weather service-wide prioritization. And um, we in this room can provide the information, the background, the science, the technology about what needs to be done and what can be done. But it is really a strategic decision whether you are going to spend a third or, or, or two-thirds of your resources on that one forecast part or whether you're going to spend a sixth of your resources on it. And we can, provi we, can, we can provide everything we want and all the arguments we want. But that, from my perspective, that is a strategic decision that needs to be made higher up in the weather service. That is not something that, as an EMC director, I feel that is really in my wheelhouse I don't think it's in Bill's wheelhouse. I think that it's really eventually up onto the council level and up to the Louis level. But the point is, the big difference between what we used to do and trying to do is that we used to have individual people with an individual solution go directly to Louis. With this, we should go to Louis with uh, exactly that same way that, uh, that uh, was mentioned before. This is what we could do. This is what it costs. This is the money we have. Which thing do you want to do? Which thing do you not want to do? And that, that should not be my decision. Although I'll be very loud in my opinion. Uh, um, this sounds great, but I have a few alarm bells going off in my head. It's nice to say, and I've said before, a few years ago, I said, why don't we stop looking at 500 millibar height anomaly correlation so we can concentrate on really improving the model. A minor problem with that is, have you convinced Louis 500 millibar height doesn't matter anymore, especially when it comes to the European Center? But the more major problem is 500 millibar height, I think, is a good measure of the, general, of the large scale circulation of the atmosphere. And I think that's still important. And extending that out in time is still important. So I think we have to be rather careful about jumping from one extreme to another. Um, you say a small list of variables. Well, good luck with that because I'm hearing more and more variables all the time. And I'm ta I, what I'm hearing is, well, you have to look at CAPE. Oh, by the way, you can't look just at surface CAPE. You need to look at other ones in certain, certain situations. And you can't just look at zero Z. You have to look at all four cycles. <coughs> out. And throughout my career, the, you know, I've been trying to find problems in the GFS, and it seems like one of the problems is a lot of the developers say, well, you want us to fix individual problems, but we want to introduce better science. And you need both, both approaches. Are we going to go too far towards patching problems? In other words, there's a two-meter temperature problem. We must fix it now. So we want rush in and change something to fix it. We don't really have time to ask what happens in a different regime. What happens when you have, you know, two wet Texas and two wet California rather than drought in both places? You know, I don't think we understand regime dependence. We don't understand low frequency variability, and that's going to be a problem, especially because that's going to influence soil moisture and so on. It's going to influence everything. I don't know if we'll be able to test long enough for that. So I think there's a trade-off here. We may want us to fix problems immediately. We can do that. But maybe our time would be better spent to step back and say, wait a minute, how are we, what's the real problems of the boundary layer? Is it the boundary layer? Is it the surface flex as well? And that is going to take more time. So I have, I think this sounds great, and I, we certainly need to know how the forecasts are used. But I'm a little afraid we're going to be too caught up in immediate problems and not being going to be stepping back. And also... Now, I know nothing about physics, but knowing nothing about the subject never made me keep my mouth shut. So um, I think there's a problem also is, you know, the last year or two, I've been amazed how quickly we're getting solutions to temperature problems over the CONUS. 
But the hurricane center seems to be having trouble with our forecast. How do we fix? How do we even look at their concerns? You know, is there a major problem in the GFS that has come in as we jump to higher resolution? Um, we don't know. I'm not even sure we know how to look for that. And I think the thing is, as we work with you, remember, the GFS is global. No one is coming to me would say, oh, I think I can make a better Hadley cell. Well, isn't the Hadley cell rather important for the jet stream over East Asia? Isn't that rather important for day seven over the West Coast? So I think there's a lot of problems, and I think we have to make sure we have a long vision here, not just the immediate problem. I understand. And then I think it's rather remarkable that now you're relying, you think enough of the GFS to look at it and say, this is, this is lousy, the two-meter temperatures. You know, when I started, we didn't worry so much about that. Anyway, it's just random thought. Well, I, I hear you, and I agree with you, because, because that, it is absolutely true in any kind of operation model, not just the GFS, that you have to balance the quick-fix tuning to get a quick, quick better result with the long improvement. And, and there's no doubt about that. I think <coughs> the biggest key here uh, is also in, in strategically doing a different uh, amount of work. Historically, OAR and the Weather Service have been completely separate in what they were doing. The simple fact that you have Craig and Louis uh, much more aligned, that we have all these processes in place right now that for the type of research that OAR is doing that is supposed to be supporting R2O, that we actually have uh, people like Dave and me having to sign off on the fact that the research is actually uh, useful for uh, operational modeling. Uh, that simple fact that we're trying to align NOAA research with NOAA operations and that we're trying to align external research with operations, that is going to be a game changer because we've been uh, listened to Cliff and some of the other folks from UMAC. Uh, it's ridiculous that we can align all the resources that we have to pull in the same direction. The fact that uh, Craig McLean and Louis Cellini have made it one of their, their very high visibility things to get OAR research and weather service re uh, research aligned uh, properly should actually give us a, a, a situation where what you're talking about is not just more work, but there's actually more people working on it. And that's what we really need. And we really need, uh, as an example, it takes you five years to pick up a completely new model and put it into operation if it's, if it's not a, a very complex system like the CFS. It takes you a year or less to do an incremental upgrade to an existing system. So if Stan is doing work uh, with, uh, with uh, one model, that I then have to apply and input into another model. It'll take me four or five years. If Stan works with the same model I work with because I took his or he took mine, don't care what, I can do, I can do many, many more upgrades for the same cost. And we, we've shown in the HWARF, in the CRTM, in WaveWatch, in our use of MOM and of HICOM, that if you do this, you can accelerate your improvements like crazy. And so that's, that's the missing link in what you're saying. We need to make sure that we have this alignment in research and development all the way through. And this is why I mentioned that we really need to make sure that we are aligned for war on forecast from day one. Got to turn on now. Uh, if this requirement thing is what we need, and I, I'm sure it is, so why can't we just start a Google Doc and just put on if they put on? There must be uh, such uh, lists of requirements that are out there already. Just a few pages, you know, just to get, you know, what's our meeting global requirements, regional requirements, uh, distinguish uh, a storm structure between rotating and linear and so on. And just to get a couple of these things, 
do we have such a document? I mean, I'd, I'd rather cut to the chase here and not hide behind, oh, we don't have requirements, Hendrick, and I guess the audience here, for those of you in the audience, could we uh, accelerate this process to get some requirements down and be able to move out? So how about if we start a Google document, could we actually nominate and find out if there's any documents that are out here right now uh, that have been done uh, over the last five years or something like that? I'm just thinking regions maybe might know about such things. We could add to that. Maybe in each one of these columns, have what are the key things we're trying to do? And I guess uh, not the answer to the question, not the model selected, but what are the phenomena or kinds of behavior that users need guidance on? Do we have such a document? Anybody? So we can start one. Yeah, go ahead. Bruce. In other words, a few of us will start shooting ourselves or just go work for the weather company if we just languish in this forever. So, <clears throat> Gee, I thought I was going to be jumping to the FAA. Um, no, Bruce Antwistle, uh, Sue at AWC. Uh, I know internally we have some documents associated with things like statements of work uh, with the FAA saying we will do X, Y, Z by time one, two, or three. Uh, in particular, we've got uh, a focus on developing cloud and visibility forecasts as part of an effort to provide information in the land between the tasks especially with uh, respect to the helicopter and emergency management flights. So, a, you know, we have this Mission Delivery Council that Bill Offense had talked about yesterday. They, they want to kind of be in charge of this. That's good. But let's get them some stuff. Let's feed them some stuff. And we've been in another five years or, or even really one year to do this. Uh, that we, we, can, we certainly can do far better than that, I think. Hey, Glenn, Glenn brought up some, some good points that I think we want to emphasize as we, as we start to move ahead, and we may discuss this more in the, in the next panel in terms of how do we go about an evaluation process. There are certain things that I think objective metrics can be very helpful for, but we can't depend on that totally to give us all of the answers, even though we'd like to believe it would be something that can be quantified along those lines. I think we've learned in our work in the last 15 years, certainly in the HWT, that there is a role for subjective aspects, and that has to be factored in as well. Uh, we don't want to make it entirely a, a numbers game as such, uh, and we want to have forecaster insights who can uh, the forecasters can provide a lot of information uh, that's important to them, and sometimes you can't exactly come up with a metric. We don't have all the metrics that we necessarily need. So it isn't necessarily saying if we come up with a better CAPE, that means we've solved our structural problems. Well, you can get the same CAPE value with 100 different vertical profiles if you work at it, and they can all be meaningful in certain ways. So. I don't want us to think that as long as we just come up with metrics and we've solved the issue, we need to take a, a holistic look at this, and I think that's one way where we'll be able to get the forecasters more directly involved. Complete, uh, completely, agree with, completely agree with that. Uh, there's some beautiful examples in the rest of the world where metrics or rating systems completely kill something. But uh, the, the point is that uh, if you don't look at CAPE, in the GFS, you get you, you get unpleasant surprises like the one we had with the last implementation. So, so, so it's definitely not the, the end all, but it's it's a good tool to be able to be more complete. But it's just a tool, and just part of the tool. So, so, my badge was is almost a week old. So that's uh, <laughs> that's how much you know. So, so the, the, the no environment is a little bit new to me, but. But uh, the environment I came from in, in Navy and DOD was very, was very heavily focused on making sure that the, the operational requirements were well enough, uh, were well enough uh, prioritized and well enough defined that the scientific community could translate those into the parameters necessary for uh, for the model development for the product, for the implementation. 
So I think, so, so Henrik, the, the, the process that you just defined, whereby the, the, uh, the operational community, so as I see that here, that's the, that's the regional centers, or the, sorry, the incident centers, that's the regional offices, that's the, the, the weather service office, the forecast offices who are in touch with the customer, the user community, they know what they need. Well, there are other folks in here and through, I guess, through the OSTI, where those can be de defined and articulated in terms of the science needed to bring that along. And then from that, that's where you get the, that's where you tie those operational requirements those, and those impact-based decisions and what you need for that into the program that enables the, 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 the model to, to, to continue to develop and enables you to tighten your suite up. Um, I, I think it's a, it, I, I think the community at large has been wrestling with this for many, many years. So I suspect it's probably frustra more frustrating for some of us than others uh, as we try to work through it. But I, I think now everyone's talking about it and everyone's putting together in, in place the structures necessary that will en enable it to work. And I think it's, the next step is for those of us who are in the operational, who, who are in touch with the operational users to be able to help define those requirements, not so much worry about some of the details of the parameters, but at least be able to talk about them in terms of what the user actually needs and then work with the scientific community to help to, to, help to move those along. I just want to say a little bit more on requirements. It seems like that word is in vogue right now. And I think we don't at all have an agreement on even what a requirement is. I mean, I've heard everything from what the forecasters want, which seems like a pretty good place to start, um, even an FAA possible requirement, international community. But it just, if we're going to have requirements being the thing that really makes us a better enterprise, we need to define what that even really is. I mean, if one region wants, says we need it, is that a request? And if three regions say it, it's a requirement, I mean, we haven't even established that. Another thing, this is kind of in the weeds, but it seems like I've heard this theme that the core doesn't matter as much, it's the physics and everything, but the science is really part of the requirements too. I mean, when did there become a requirement that we need storm scale models that was kind of enabled by the science? So for example, I'll go to the global scale. What if we discover to get good position of short waves at you know, five to eight days, we need really good numerics, and that could be a scientific requirement. And so we really need to think about that, I guess the points I want to make. Teamwork exercise with EMC. I kind of want to maybe get kind of close off one part of the requirements discussion before I ask something else. I, I don't think we have to have a, a, a council tell us that we have a requirement to do a better forecast. I think that's a, a, we all, EMC, they know their requirement is to provide the best quality current and future state of the atmosphere and surface or whatever that they can. And so to make things, to make their next model upgrade better, they don't need a vetted external requirement to improve the quality. I think the real issue that we've had a problem with in the past has been priorities and resources. So we've got a million small little requirements, but it gets back to, you know, we only got so much money, so much time, so many people. What, what's the most important thing I can work on and what can I stop to do it? That's what we've been lacking and I think the council process will help us fix that. There's no perfect requirements process, but I think we're gonna get better. So getting on to the, the something a little bit different, Earlier on, Hendrik, you mentioned that uh, when you're answering uh, Andy uh, Edmonds' question about uh, uh, when you're going to retire GFS, you made the point that some of the improvements that you make are going to roll over uh, into the future model because you're doing it through the integrated system. You also made a point during that, that question is we have to look at what can we do to have the best impact. So <clears throat> in, in making improvements through all these scales, you had to pick two or three things to work on the next couple of years, <clears throat> where do you think the biggest bang for the buck would be in terms of improve, improvements? Is it in the data assimilation? I've heard that secondhand that if we only get our data assimilation, we'd already be as good as the Europeans. I know that's a secondhand thing. I don't know if that's true or not. Or is it in the data quality? I mean, are there certain things that you know that you already kind of have an idea of what important short-term work uh, would give you the biggest payoff? It depends on depends on where it depends on where you whether you look uh, in in general speaking 
uh, we need to have much more focus on the physics. We we we, we lag behind on that. I think that that's uh, and and that is something that we are trying to address with the way we're going forward. Um, on on the other bits and pieces of it, uh, obviously uh, data simulation is very important too. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of things at this moment that that we need to do as an organization that do not directly impact the quality of the models that, that we need to do in order to more rapidly improve them. So going to this much more unified system, going to a, a unified couple of modeling system, going to a modular uh, uh, modeling system, going to uh, proper uh, uh, software management and uh, uh, ratification, all that kind of stuff. A lot of these things, a lot of these things are not sexy because, as you do them, at the moment you do them, they should have zero impact. But if we don't do these now and put a real focus on getting NIMS really into place within a year and a half, uh, uh, if we don't do that, we keep wasting resources that we can't use for the other stuff. So. Physics on the modeling side, no doubt about it. DA, we've made some really big progress. Uh, thanks to the Sandy, we need to make sure we keep doing that or even further accelerate it. On the, on, on the, and this is more subjective. On the general side, uh, we've done a lot in improving our individual models. Uh, what is missing is really the physics on the interface of the model. So model coupling in general, we need to figure out where, where and how that is really big impact. And it's really big impact already proven in some places. We need to see how far we can take that. But if we don't do the infrastructure, if we don't do a unified post processor, if we don't do a validation system, if we don't do a, um, a uh, community supported uh, environment to have the resources run our models in efficiently, all these things have no direct immediate impact. On, on the quality of the models. But if we do them, you'll start seeing everything else accelerate. So that's very important too. Although that's not actually putting money in the, in, in the improvements right now. So my quick follow-up, I'm with you. So do you have the resources you need and the top cover to, to make these a priority today? Or do you need, do you need something more to happen from on from from whether it's the MDC or anything else to give you the the authority or the resource you need, or do you think you already have what you need to go forward with something like that? I would be amiss to say that I have enough. You would never say that either. But the reality is, from a very personal level, I would have never taken this job if I wouldn't have had the impression that we are better aligned than ever to this. And uh, it is uh, similar to what Bill. Uh, said uh, yesterday, we are in pretty rich times right now. At this moment, uh, with the way SDI is going particularly, we are in a unique situation to do a whole bunch of things that we've never been able to do before. It's up to us to get well organized and get well managed with that. And in two years' time, that situation may be completely different. And yes, we can always use more, but uh, we are now, for the first time, really trying to fill the gaps that are there identify the high priority things and uh, both on coupling on DA and on physics uh, there is I don't know if we can get everything exactly we want but we are we are far ahead of where we were in the past Hendrick um, this is Eric Baylor speaking from Nesta Star um, when we're talking about requirements, we're looking at some of the increasing um, mission priorities across No, We look at the Arctic, for one, and we have to figure out how the, who the users are going to be for that, rather than just the atmosphere. We have other kinds of requirements to think about in terms of the ocean and the coupled modeling that's going on. Likewise, if we look in terms of what EMC is going to be doing in support of the ecological forecasting roadmap, as we have a nested framework uh, being pursued at the global, regional, and local kinds of things. And we have to look at how those requirements are going to be um, derived and, and c captured. And likewise, 
EFC needs, or NSEP, I should say, in general, uh, needs to be looking at how they can pass these requirements on to the NOAA Research Council because they're starting a unified modeling uh, working group to pursue our gu to guide where research is being happening across, and integrating it across the, uh, the NOAA line offices. So there's a number of things here that absolutely dictate that we need to pursue the requirements. And, and to go back to that on the Arctic side, I'll just make that with uh, my first question earlier. Um, the thing that makes life unique right now at the EMC side is that we got a requirement to do demonstrations for the Arctic and from day one. And so <coughs> those are resources for two or three years, and we'll decide then if and how and when to put into full operation. So that's point one. Uh, I completely agree with the overall view of what you're saying in terms of the Arctic. It is specifically uh, guided to where where we're going, and it comes out of out of service requirements uh, that are partially driven in, uh, internationally through WMO and IOC. Uh, on the on the ecosystem side, we've uh, on the marine ecosystem side, we've been trying to to uh, to uh, play it well and play it safe in the sense that. In the ecosystem roadmap, we've made it extremely clear that as weather service, as NSEP, we see ourselves as enabling that, not necessarily as executing it. And uh, in that way, uh, uh, the work we're doing uh, does not become an other unfunded mandate yet. And if NOAA wants to make marine ecosystems part of their entire environmental real-time and we have to go exactly the same way as with the other things. We have to properly resource it. So at this moment, if you look at what we've done at EMC <coughs> to deal with that, we've been supporting NOS to be able to run their uh, their bay models and run uh, app and, and other uh, pilot projects there. Uh, we have one person on the EMC side who is specialized in marine ecosystems. Uh, which is a strategic choice to be able to, to talk to it, but we will not start doing very massive uh, ecosystem efforts until there are resources for that or until we can see that it's an essential step to get the physical modeling of the ocean better. Yes, but you also have to think in terms of biogeochemical modeling, which requires a global perspective, especially for things like ocean acidification. And I know there's some initial pilot effort being worked on that, but we can't just, uh, well, we have to start pursuing resources to support those requirements, clearly, but we can't just ignore them either. No, but uh, I don't think many of us feel like unfunded mandates. Okay. I'm, I'm going to uh, disagree somewhat with the uh, gentleman two ahead of me, uh, that uh, about the value of requirements for EMC. Uh, I, from my experience, it actually is rather useful. Uh, and there's a few different ways of getting it, so I'll go for a couple. Uh, one is, uh, as one speaks farther up the management chain, you get more and more questions about who's, who is this for. And having a requirement where someone has you know, sent an email or written on Stan's uh, uh, spreadsheet that I need this thing for this reason, uh, then I just pull out this, the email or spreadsheet and say, okay, here's why. Uh, and that goes uh, much, uh, much easier. Uh, another part, and perhaps one of the reasons uh, I get certain questions, is uh, uh, we have a lot of smart, hardworking people, creative. We can think of enough different things to implement every three days, uh, everything in the system. Well, maybe not three days, but, um, you know, we have enough ideas for multiple implementations of every system every year. Uh, and we said, you know, there's no way that could actually be done uh, for, you know, for many reasons. So one of the uh, uh, routes to focusing the, the efforts on making sure we're improving the things <laughs> that actually matter to people is to know what people uh, want to see improved. 
we certainly have our own ideas about how to improve, how, how many things to improve, uh, what would be next. Uh, but we can also easily outstrip the ability of the system to deal with all the potential improvements. So having a list of nobody at all cares about these parameters, some people care about this, everyone cares about that, uh, then we can, uh, you know, then we have our prioritization to, uh, to ensure that within the time we spend uh, working on making improvements, we're actually addressing the ones that you care about. The, uh, the discussion has drifted a little bit towards requirements, and we have an entire session for that tomorrow. So I'd like to see us get back a little bit more toward the uh, production suite. Jeff, do you want to ask me what, what you, you want to ask me about the production suite? Yeah, that I'm, I'm glad you asked that question, Jeff M or Jeff, because I title of this is future of model production suite. So again, I guess I I need to be rooted a little more into what what you would like to discuss here, because I guess I, we started with this slide and the slide sort of summarizes existing suite. So what, that you basically could, uh, instead of having 20 modeling systems, you, you could, in principle, uh, concentrate on half of that or less. So that, that's what was discussed a little bit already over the last few years. But there, are some, there are some other things that we haven't touched upon at all. And um, that is, um, at the Sudo conference, a big discussion about local modeling. Does local modeling fit the future of the weather service? Well, Louis says no. Well, does that mean that we agree with it? Uh, what do we do? And, 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 and uh, another question that is really unanswered here is that little red box. So in an ideal world, would we run a one the entire web scale every Or are we going to do that on a sort of H4 style? Those are some of the questions. How, how do you do what, what, what do we do with the end? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think someone on the phone. <laughs> but I, I mean, Could you please mute your question. phone? Uh, please mute your phone. Your breathing is actually overpowering the speakers. Thanks, Enrique. You mute too, please. So, no worries, Mike. So what I was hoping that this discussion would kind of get into is since we had kind of agreed to the the general sense of of, of, of where we're going in say three to five years is the daunting task of thinking about how the transition occurs because you have all these models and now now what? So I, I, I guess I had a different expectation for the discussion. So you know, when we drifted into, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure what you were looking for or the organizers the meeting from this particular. Okay. Well, my, my, first, my first issue is that we've been talking to about this kind of idea internally a lot. It needs to be fed and, and we need to make sure that it's not just a presentation. I need to have some feedback. And I think I got quite a bit of feedback that I need. Uh, yeah, the, the, depending on where that was going, uh, your other question about how to get there, that's the next question. And since we have time for that, I think it's a, a good question to move into. And um, the way I look at that on the rightmost side, the, this is what I mentioned in the beginning, on the now side, we have to figure out how EMC and AFS, the branch and AFS, work together well and stop coordinating better. There's no doubt about it. The war on forecast is, is really a resource and long-term design issue. Uh, the uh, the day or the, <laughs> the HPF 
Curie. We already had a lot of discussions on that. And we may have some disagreement about how the short-term plan is. I don't think we have a disagreement on the long-term plan. It's just going to be very interesting to see if five years from now we're talking about a wharf-based system or a system that is actually also transitioning to whatever the core is that we're choosing for the, for the world of Mars. Uh, the real key is what you do with that middle, with that middle block. Um, what, what do you do to have, instead of having a GFS, a GAFS, a NAM, a STREF, a RAP, a hurricane model, and probably a few more bits and pieces, how, how do you start killing that down? And <coughs> I, I uh, applaud Jeff for, for doing a real effort in, into, into figuring out how to do that. And I, I, I really want to recognize, particularly our Meso group, as if you if you think how often EMC is being being accused of being in, uh, internally looking and not wanting to, to get rid of old stuff, this is pretty revolutionary what these guys are looking at uh, for an organization to do that from the inside out and not being being forced to do that. Uh, so so that that requ that that. Uh, that uh, uh, justifies a shout out to them for willing to do that and for actually to seriously do that. But the, the thing is, do we agree that we want to do something like this? If we agree to it, it's not asking the question, can we do it right now? Well, that's a good one to, say, to ask, but the question really is, what do we need to do to get there? And this goes back to the fact that we are not perfectly aligned between the weather service and how we are, but we're so much better than we were before. And now we are in a situation that if we can agree upon it, that uh, there are certain questions that need to be answered right now. I know that Kevin and other bosses of, of, of Stan and Stan himself are more than willing to jump on that right away. And we had never had that before, and it's absolutely fantastic, at least not in that way. It's absolutely fantastic to know that we can get there. So, a little bit of a, of, a, of a used car salesman speak, okay. but but um, yeah, how do we get there? I think I think we I think we need to identify what we can do immediately, and that's one of the stuff the things that, that Jeff has been looking at already. And we need to identify what we need to do in research to make it happen, and start doing that research particularly. And one of the things that I noticed, and I, I hope to get a lot as much feedback as possible. Of that. One of the things I noticed is that, that observation on the physics. We need to make sure that our global models have sufficiently sophisticated physics that they can provide proper profile information that are much more in alignment with the better profile data that comes out of the message. If, if we can put that into a global model, then collapsing that middle column suddenly becomes a lot more feasible. And Anybody who has ideas or other thoughts or disagrees, please let me know. I was just going to say to build on the, what Hendrick and Jeff said, uh, one of the questions uh, that's been answered in the presentations was, uh, how, what are your plans and needs for the next one to two years? And, and you've seen some initial plans by the branch chiefs to uh, where they would like to go in the next one to two years. And, the question to all our visitors here is, uh, now that you've seen those presentations, do they uh, mesh with what you have in mind and what you think you're going to need the next one, two, one to two years? Do you think that's the path that uh, we need to go on? Okay, so if you want to fill in your pink block up there on Warren on Forecast, I guess from my definition of Warren and Forecast, I'm thinking maybe 3 to 12 hours, maybe 3 to 15 hours. And I'm wondering, and you'd be able to tell me if I'm off base here or not, but I'm thinking not only convection for Warren and Forecast, I'm thinking snow bands, I'm thinking other phenomena such as that. Uh, is it not possible, or, or what would be needed if you want to get started now, what would be needed to beef up something like the HER or the NAM Nest to be a kind of a, a subset of your day one activities, to be a, a the warn on forecast, be a subset of that day, your, your day column activities? What would be required to 
beef up those models if need be in order to perform that function of Warner and Forecast. Is that a reasonable first step, a reasonable first approach? Can we take advantage of what we have there right now? Absolutely, and, and, and it's a no-brainer that there's no way we can do this for the whole country to begin with, and it's not the, it's not the right way to do the research either. So it's a no-brainer to do it either locally or to do it with something relocatable initially. And so, and so yeah, you have to, the whole point <laughs> with some of these things is uh, the, further, the further you go out from what our our, our uh, area of, uh, of uh, happiness is that we're doing already, uh, you have to be a little bit more careful because you have to actually show that it actually works. And, and, and so, so yeah, I, I do think that there's a lot of value in starting to, to run pilots, although it takes people out of work with somebody to, some people to pilots on these kind of things to help us fill in that box. The other thing that we really need on that box is to figure out how to do a DA on a quote-unquote science level compatible to what we do at the at the, uh, at the, the global side with that. Right now, what we're doing on the HER side, uh, uh, assimilation-wise, is, is uh, far ahead of uh, what a lot of people in the rest of the world do, but it's also an engineering approach rather than uh, a, a more quote-unquote science-based approach. And don't get me wrong, I'm a very proud engineer. I love engineering. Uh, this is, not, this is not, not a negative thing at all. <coughs> but we have to figure out how we can do uh, the proper type of DA for these kind of models. That's, that's really, from where I'm sitting, okay, I'm not a DA guy, and, uh, but I've, I've been around uh, uh, that part of the world enough to realize that there are a lot of unanswered questions there, and the unanswered questions there are going to tell you, are, are all <laughs> at the level of how expensive does the system need to be. So they're going to be strategically as well as technically very important. So I guess we would say, based on things over the last 10 years, that we kind of know what we need to do here. The ensemble data simulation, we do know how to do that at the storm scale. Yes, it needs some requirements, uh, some computing resources to be able to do that. Can uh, I think that's uh, something that is part of what we proposed at the end of Trevor's talk that could be done in the pretty near future here uh, with the WCOS expansion. So again, storm scale ensemble DA is a key aspect. We're also running a smaller nest, and I think that, you know, having these smaller nests, but I think the first step is to get that ensemble uh, hourly updating data simulation. And I think we do know how to do that because we've seen it demonstrated a lot in the community already uh, through uh, NSSL, NCAR, and within our own lab. Um. The War on Forecast Project, this is Jack Kane from NSSL. Um, War on Forecast Project, uh, as it was funded by OAR, was specifically, uh, the, the mandate was to find a way to come up with a, see if we could come up with a way to uh, allow forecasters to give a one-hour lead time um, on tornado warnings. And so we've been very specifically focused on that project, which is a very long-term goal. Um, but I think um, the concept has caught on. Um, it's certainly applicable to a lot of different scales, and I think the funding is now starting to expand to allow us to include some of those scales in our research. So I think we're moving and certainly moving in that direction, and we'll work with Stan and others um, to accomplish the goals in that direction. Um, but I think that is, I think that's one of the challenges that we have is trying to um, sort of reconcile the world forecast, the tornado prediction problem with what um, what uh, the low hanging fruit is in terms of uh, using um, rapid rapid updates and um, uh, you know assimilating radar data, assimilating actual storm structures. And making very short-term term predictions, um, with you know extending those things out to multi-hour predictions, um, we got to fill in the uh, the spectrum. Yeah, this is Jeff Demego. Um, the 
you know, we don't even have a, con a robust convection allowing scale uh, ensemble yet. So I, I really think it's premature to be thinking about the uh, warn on forecast challenge. In fact, I had, I had scrolled the section of one of my slides off the page that dealt with what I consider swarm scale being one kilometer or better resolution. Um, the big challenge we're going to have, and we're sort of talking around this, talking at this, in getting the CAM ensemble is how much of the machine are we going to get? Uh, you know, we could easily fill the machine and still not have um, storm scale ensemble. Just just the three kilometer scale ensemble could could use the majority of the machine. Uh, so, you know, we we my sights are set fairly low in a small you know, six ish uh, member ensemble and. Uh, trying to find ways by alternating CONUS and Alaska or whatever uh, and extensions to make it fit and not take up more than half of the machine because there are a lot of others who would like to use that machine as well. And there, for example, the reforecasting of gas in a routine way. Um, you name a component of the production suite and they're looking to, uh, to fill the machine or to have a sizable chunk of that machine. So. The issue of who's going to make that decision isn't clear. Maybe it is the MDC or the other one. I can't remember the other one. Uh, and there's also a uh, high performance computing resource, co resource council, which decides a lot about the, uh, the, compute, the supercomputers these days. So it isn't clear to me how that's going to come about. Uh, I do suspect we're going to We'll, we'll need to establish a requirement for the CAM. I don't think that's going to be very hard to do. Um, I mean, unless we get down in the weeds, then, then we could be thumb wrestling over the details for a good long while. But uh, I just I worry that we need to decide about the computer very soon. In other words, I'm targeting the end of 17 in, in my plan, which is a proposal. And, and I think if we don't make a decision fairly soon about how we can put the pieces together to do that, then we're not going to likely make that target. And between the uh, reforecast needs, the water center needs, uh, the expanding uh, website, storm surge needs, uh, a column needs, but really request in most of the cases still. Um, from what I've seen, we've already got a conservative estimates, uh, including, including either the, uh, the uh, suggestion to build a wharf-based uh, HREF or a uh, two-core HREF. Uh, back of the envelope, I've already got conservative requests that use of the machine two or three times. It's, uh, everybody is always talking about this big machine, but we are so good at filling these things up. It's amazing. And <coughs> There's another little side effect of this. Two years ago, when we put in, um, or, or when we put in the 13-kilometer GFS, we were able to be extremely aggressive using the W cost uh, or the operation machine, because at that time the R&D part of the NOAA compute was much bigger than the operational side. So, in order to work efficiently as EMC. Uh, which is done by every other major modeling center in the world, you have to have either a, a, somewhere between a 3 to 1 or 5 to 1 ratio between R&D compute or transition compute and actual operational compute. Uh, we had that two years back. We had the one-on-one -on, -one on, the, on the operation machine and on its backup, and we had a two times as big part of uh, Zeus to get to that 3 to 1 ratio. Right now, Thea, the major, one of the two major R&D computers from NOAA, is smaller than the middle piece of one of my two operational machines. So Stan and company are hurting like crazy for not having the R&D compute to further develop and uh, do the research on it. I'm hurting like crazy because I cannot fill up the 
the operational part of the machine because I don't have the resources to support it on the backup and on the R&D side. So we, we are, at, at some point in the previous cycle of the machine, we were able to fill the operational machine up to something like close to 70% of peak performance, unheard of in any computer center. On this machine, we are probably going to be forced to use a smaller fraction of the operational machine for real operations because we will need that machine for running retrospectives, for running testing, for running reforecast. And that's, that, that's a sad story, but the reality. We, and I've been pushing very hard to NOAA for giving the R&D folks more compute so I can get the backup compute to actually really use this machine. We, we get a lot of visibility on how big our operation machine is, but we're forgetting that we don't have the resources to support it. And that's a sad story, but it's Peter Neely from the Weather Company again, and from you now I have my UMAC hat on, and just want to respond from that perspective to the question that Jeff Domingo just asked: Who's going to make the decision? From the UMAC perspective, we recognize this, and that was one of the key reasons why we recommended the creation of a chief scientist position, who gathers all of the evidence and makes the decision, uh, and that person needs to have the cloud. Um, and the authority to make those decisions because it's going to, they're never really going to be stepping on toes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'd like to also address something Jeff Domingo said, too. Um, living way out there in the Pacific, the other part of the OCONUS, he just kind of mentioned, you know, the CONUS in Alaska. And since the topic of this discussion is, you know, future of the NSEP production suite, um, I, I guess my question would be how does OPC and, and the Pacific region and, you know, some of the Hurricane Center and all that stuff fit in here, too, that has... Um, responsibilities and we need improvements and, you know, things to move forth, um, move further and better for our tool set out there. Uh, that, in that context, it's going to be very interesting to see if the organization of the reorganization of the web has had any impact. Because historically, with the way we decided what went to do AWIPS and things like that, all the different uh, areas had the same the same uh, uh, vote numbers, and we would see nothing of Alaska and, uh, and Pacific go ever into it, into uh, into AWIPS and things like that. So uh, I don't know. I hope that I hope that on the NOAA side, the councils are going to be more balanced than the decision process that we have been before. On our side, we we will <coughs> make sure that we treat everybody equal in terms of. Uh, uh, interaction, contact, and making sure that we get your requirements. Uh, I am not sure if I have enough cloud on being able to uh, decide where the actual resources are going. Well, I guess my question is going to be a second part here then. What do I need to do without being a horrible squeaky wheel to, <laughs> to ensure that those uh, requirements get heard and, and are addressed and taken care of? I suggest you become a horrible squeaky wheel. Oh, sorry. You <laughs> well, I can do that. <laughs> I'd rather well, not, but I, but if it takes that, I'll do it. In in general, I think we are in a, in a unique situation uh, in terms of at least the modeling part of it. That uh, with uh, Bill and Louie in the positions they are in, uh, we have uh, a much better understanding of the the general needs than we would have had before. Uh, I think that, that within NCEP, NCO and EMC are sort of unique in the sense that uh, they don't necessarily fit into a lot of the work that the rest of the weather service does. And, and having, having that experience up at higher management uh, 
hopefully gets a little bit more balanced. Uh, the other thing is just put out, put put out, put out requirements, and 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 it's it's up, up to up to us and uh, to to make sure they get fed well, and it is up to us to give the the um, the uh, uh, proper ammunition to the folks higher up in the organization to make the right decision. And uh, I I don't know what else to say because I realize that. Sitting off in the corner with very few people around you, relatively speaking, a lot of terrain, uh, especially wet terrain. Uh, I don't know what to say about that because you are in a uh, in a, in a uh, uh, less fortunate position there than some other people, unfortunately. Well, I'm going to go back to my comments I made when I was up on the base, and I implore upon you guys to come out and please see what we're doing and what we really need, so that we're not coming out of left field when we toss the requirements out. Uh, Hendrik, one one thing. Um, question came from back of the room, and, and obviously it says atmosphere up there, and we've been talking about many different kinds of systems. So we could imagine building a matrix like this for, um, you know, land hydrology, uh, waves, sea ice, ocean, et cetera, et cetera. There you go. <laughs> I had forgotten that. I, this is actually from from well, what the, what Stan was saying. Let's put a Google document up. I'm, I'm, I'm building a much larger slide deck that does this for all the bits and pieces. Perfect, so yeah. All the bits and pieces will be asked for input for that over the next few weeks, and I'm still sort of struggling whether I'm going to do that with a Google document or whether I'm going to uh, more manually do some of that stuff. And that same slide deck also has a whole section on all the requirements I'm going to try to try to, uh, to uh, solicit from, or the request to take to try to solicit. In some place in there, there's the implicit um, coupling between slide one and slide two in some sort of uh, space in between. There you go. Got it. Okay. Jeff Craven here, Central Region. Now, this may be a <coughs> personal preference by how my brain works, but uh, just thinking about we, earlier you talk about Priorities, and we always have more priorities than we can accomplish with resources. Uh, AWIP's program has an S rec where we say we've got X amount of things, and then everybody goes in and puts a priority, and then that's used in the decision. Now, I thought we had an AWIP's folk here, but I would be curious to see is that is there some possible parallels where we we could throw all those priorities up there and then actually have, you know, sort of a, well, a, a, a voting, pro at least at least to inform that whoever makes the final decision what how they're prioritized rather than, because in the past we went and we requested and said, hey, Stan, we want this, or hey, Jeff, we want that. So is that possible? I think I think it's possible, and this goes back to the fact of uh, do we uh, am I going to take or somebody of us going to take uh, just uh, take ownership of that uh, without uh, to fill a vacuum, so to speak? Because if we do this the way AFS used to be run, well, this is the reason why for almost ten years I had to get my wave models into the back door to Alaska because it was always voted down by everybody else. And uh, we have to get a more balanced system, and this is exactly the same issue with the Pacific uh, side. Uh, not, not all centers, not all users are equal. Uh, I don't think all users have to be equal, but we cannot have a, uh, a situation where... Uh, uh, groups are systematically ignored, and that has happened in the past too. And so, so I, I know you just made me as, a, as an example. Uh, AWIPS is not an example that makes me very uh, have, have very happy moments. Jeff Domego, I want to address Bill's comment. In in the regional side, we have supported Alaska and Hawaii in the RTMA the high-res window, both cores, 
and in the NAM nest. Um, and in fact, we have made a distinct effort to have a system that's efficient enough to support all of the weather service regions in the same amount of compute space. Now those decisions quite often are then accused us, we get accused of doing lousy science. Uh, but there's a reason behind what we do. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, well, we've come to our break time, and there's, we've been touching on this revising the implementation process, which will come after the break. Um, but considering a, uh, a production suite that's in place, uh, how do we revise the implementation process? Then we'll have a panel discussion that will follow on that. So we'll come back here at 345. Thank you.